and welcome to Live with the Author. Today we have a really special um, interview with one of our authors from the special issue on the science of reading. I'm Amanda Goodwin and I'm one of the co-editors of Reading Research Quarterly. I'm also an associate professor at Vanderbilt University and this is Joe Elliott. Joe, welcome. Oh, hello, lovely to, be, lovely to be talking to you and uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Fantastic. Well, and you're, and the title of your paper is "It's Time to Be Scientific About Dyslexia," right? Yeah. yeah Fantastic. Because, well, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into this. Right. Well, I uh, trained as a, as a school teacher originally, uh, and this was in 1973, so it's a long time ago. And I went into uh, when I started teaching, I was teaching children with learning difficulties, both in um, special education for a few years first. And then, then um, special ed, as it were, um, in mainstream schools, like high schools, I guess. And I did that for about well, several years. And then I, and then I retrained as, a, as an educational psychologist, which is more like a school psychologist in America. I guess it's pretty close. And all throughout all that time, uh, people were talking to me about dyslexic kids. And I, both as a teacher and as a clinician, I was trying to work out, well, who are these dyslexic kids? And how do they differ from other kids? And it was quite... At the time, I kind of thought there must be a no, there must be a, a yeah there must be a field of knowledge there that somehow is eluding me. So it was very much a kind of as as I felt a bit of imposter syndrome that you know basically I'm gonna get found out that I don't know this stuff. Um, anyway, after that, after I'd done this clinical work for quite a number of years, I then went into a university and was involved in teacher education, both qualified teachers and initial teacher education training and. Again, I still had this problem, I still sense that I didn't know something I should have known. And then in 1998, I wrote a book, um, really, which dealt with a lot of problems that kids had and how you were trying to help them. And so for that, I decided, well, I'm going to look at dyslexia and try and work out what it's all about so I can understand what a dyslexic kid is, how I know one when I see one, and when I do know one and I do see one, what do I do for that young so that I don't do for the other kids with those sorts of problems, learning problems. And it was really then that I had almost kind of a road to Damascus conversion, I guess, because around that time I realized, and that was at the age of, that was at the age of about 43, um, I realized that actually there was no basis for this differentiation between the dyslexic child and the, uh, and the, the non-dyslexic poor reader. Um, and in a sense, I spent another, oh, I guess it's another 20 years or so putting all those things together. In 2014, I wrote a book which took me five years to write, which, which really I thought at the end of this, I want to be able to say what I mean by the term dyslexia. So I, I worked with Elena Grigorenko, who was professor of medicine at Yale and world leading geneticist at the time. And we covered all the bases. So we looked at ge genetics, neuroscience, cognitive science, psychology, education, educational policy, um, and, and we looked at, yeah, we just looked at all those disciplines, put it all together and try to work out what would we mean by dyslexia. And at the end of it, I came really to the conclusion that, that this term was so problematic. It was so difficult to get um, uh, any kind of consensus that it would be better just to ditch the term altogether and talk about the actual behaviours we're interested in. So what are we interested in? Are we interested in young people and adults who struggle to learn to read, decode? Um, which I call dyslexia, uh, sorry, <laughs> I, call, I call reading disability. And then there are often comorbid problems that those youngsters have um, and, we, and where those problems exist, then we need to address those problems. So we identify youngsters who seem to have trouble um, understanding language or have trouble in, 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 um, in, in their sort of memory or in their kind of everyday lives, their organization. And basically said, where those kids have those problems, well, let's address those problems. But let's not get confused with this fundamental problem we're dealing with, which is large numbers of youngsters who just are unable to decode text, and the great majority of whom get insufficient support. So that's so interesting. So it came, you came to this topic from being a teacher, and then yeah. really dived into the research and found out that this term was really problematic, because there's yeah. not a whole lot of consistency with this term. And that kind of leads me to talking a little bit about the science of reading. Lots of people think about the science of reading differently. What is the science of reading to you? Well, this is interesting because I was in Wisconsin giving some talks um, just before the COVID shutdown. And, and 
there were two issues going on at the same time. So there was one issue which I was really there to talk about, which was about the whole notion of identifying dyslexics and providing interventions for people with dyslexia and resources and so on. And there was that issue. And then there was the whole science of reading debate, which, which you know, I know is the reading wars from about 30 or 40 years I've been in. I've been kind of, uh, I've been embroiled in various ways in all of that. Um, and really what I was saying in Wisconsin to people, this was March, is we shouldn't conflate those two issues. One is about, one is about um, what do we do, uh, what's the best ways to help youngsters to learn to read? And, and where those children are struggling, what should we be doing? And in a sense, that's the, what you might call, really that's territory that's been taken over by the science of reading. And the other debate is, is there some kind of diagnostic um, cluster, some diagnostic condition that, that we can identify through some testing? And through that testing, once we've done that, we actually come up with an aptitude treat treatment interaction. In other, in other words, there's a treatment for the, that dyslexic person, but different treatment for the non-dyslexic poor reader. And what I was saying in the States when I was over there is that people have got those two things absolutely muddied. And, and you've got to separate them out. So there's the debate about the whole diagnostic stuff and whether or not we just look at the, you know, the behavior we're worried about, the reading and the, the comorbid bits. And then there's the debate about what is the right way to, to teach youngsters to learn to read and, and to what extent do we change that or transform that to help youngsters who are struggling. So these are two totally separate issues. And many when I pitched my paper to Reading Research course with me, I was saying, most of the papers in, in this special edition will cover the what you might call the science of reading uh, area. And what I'm going to do is try and cover the other area, which is about scientific evidence um, for the diagnostic game, as it were. Okay, well, I'll just say a little bit point, about- I think that point about that scientific evidence is key in the science of reading. And so how does your paper add to the science of reading discussion? Well, I guess what, I, what I'm saying is that um, that that whatever we whatever when we all come together, there, there are far too many. The extremes are ridiculous. Like at one extreme, you've got you know a, a notion of whole language which is just completely bears no uh, logic really. But a lot of people can become good readers even if they do that. Lots I've seen loads and loads of able people. But the trouble is, if you're going to have difficulties with reading at all, that really is the problem for you. And at the other end, you've got people who, in my opinion, are slavishly devoted to some packaged phonics program, um, one of which um, we all know about with a hyphen in between. And, and this particular program, um, there's no research evidence to suggest that this particular program is any more effective than lots of other structured uh, approaches to teaching reading, which tend to involve phonics as well. But uh, what I saw and next saw this absolutely in Wisconsin is these two extremes and somewhere we've got to get amongst them in between. So, um, you know, there are some really, really thoughtful people like Donna Scanlon, who, who, um, who I'm huge respect for, uh, an American researcher, who's, who you know, has a really sound understanding of the importance of making things explicit, and making things clear and systematic and the importance of phonics, but also realizing that this very mechanistic kind of approach misses out on a lot of, our, lot, lot of other aspects of reading which are also important. So it's this nuanced thing that I think is really, really important. As far as the dyslexia debate is concerned though, um, what I would say is kids who struggle to learn to read them, those kids really need that explicit instruction much more than, than other kids who will pick it up almost whatever kind of approach you do. And I feel like when I read your paper, one of the things that I really took away from um, reading it was this idea that we have to know who the kids in our studies are. And so one of the points you made was that the term dyslexia is representing so many different groups of kids that it's hard to really pull out what are the strengths and weaknesses of these yeah. different kids and what does that mean for instruction? So all of the science that we have going on, it's kind of completed with who these kids are. So we need oh, to- the real, yeah. yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the, uh, the problem I try to put across in the paper is, of course, most of the scientific studies, certainly in genetics, neuroscience, cognitive science, most of those studies, when they use the term dyslexia, they're talking about people, uh, many children, who don't do well on reading tests. And, you know, I did some work with um, 
uh, Juan uh, Lopez in Portugal, where we demonstrated uh, 800 studies of dyslexia that we studied, nearly all of them used as their participants, just people who didn't do well at reading. So, so that's how the scientists use it. But then, uh, then you've got this other bunch of people who actually say, no, you've got to, um, you've got, here's a bunch of people with poor readers. We have to work out who's dyslexic and who's not dyslexic. And, and we need to have these sort of special tests to do this because they've got special needs of one kind or another. And that doesn't stack up at all. And there's also a notion of a hidden condition of dyslexia. Somehow you have to reveal it but using these tests. There's no evidence for anything like that at all. Um, and, and neither is there any evidence, as, as Mark Seidenberg has shown, no evidence that there's some kind of special gifts or special dispositions that somehow that the person who's been unlucky to be um, to, to be unlucky in the fact that they're str struggling reader, so somehow you know they've been compensated by giving gifts which which help in another way that's not the case either but of course people who struggle to learn to read may well try to develop other areas um be, where, where, where perhaps their reading isn't such a problem and so, so and, and then what sorry oh no worries and so what do we take away from your study and tell teachers what should teachers be doing differently tomorrow based off yes. of what you found and what you I mean, what, what I think we should be saying to teachers is firstly, it's absolutely essential that you can spot kids who are struggling or have, are likely to struggle just from the earliest stages. You actually spot kids straight away and don't leave it to, you know, oh, we'll, we'll grow out of it or don't leave it to well, we'll, two or three years later, we'll get a dyslexia assessment and start from there. What the evidence shows, Jack Fletcher's work, uh, Jack Fletcher's at Texas, he's a fantastic researcher. In fact, he's kind of, if I've got a pin-up researcher in my life, it's Jack Fletcher. Um, <laughs> and it, you know, he's demonstrated, he's argued, he's shown you how important it is as the brain is developing in very young children, like first, second grade, how important it is to get the, to get the, 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 the um, you know, the kids starting right then while all the kind of the brain is developing. Um, and so what I said to teachers is we really need to get involved and identify those kids. And then if we're going to use a kind of response to intervention, multi-tier system of support or something like that, to actually to, to give those kids a bit of extra help from a very early age and monitor them very closely and then to determine whether or not they need more intense, more structured additional help from others. But the other thing I wrote in a paper about teachers is that they can be disempowered by the belief that there's this, the, the, these dyslexic kids that only specialists can, can, you know, only specialists can identify who these dyslexics are and then they need some recondite, um, esoteric program of intervention that only kind of people with advanced skills can have. Well, no, actually, they are a lot of people who do, a lot of dyslexia type tutors are very, very skilled, but we're talking about the kinds of skills that great reading teachers have. And so it's really important that we give our mainstream school teachers that understanding and those skills so they can do that at an early age and don't so, believe. So it sounds like what you're saying is that I as a teacher should both trust my informal assessment ability to say this kid is struggling, but I also should build my knowledge to know what to look for in terms Absolutely. of kids so that we can really identify them and not necessarily as dyslexic, but as having a reading disability and yeah. get the intervention support that they need. And also when, you know, yeah, I know that's really, really important because, um, because if we don't do that, all the children who don't get picked up as so-called dyslexics get lost. And the main point about the paper in terms of social equity are the huge numbers of people, both in UK and in US, huge numbers of people who get no help at all because they don't go through the dyslexia kind of procedure, which can only pick up a very, very small proportion of young people but will then have a disproportionate amount of resource which goes to them and nothing to the others and so it's really, a important, really important piece in your paper this equity piece um this idea yes. that who is getting tested who who are the advocates behind these children to get them quote unquote tested um, and quote unquote diagnosed and so um that's something i really value and think we need to embrace both as a yeah, field uh, and research. I mean, what we've shown in, in, yeah, in the piece, there's a Guardian newspaper piece, which you know, uh, which you know about, but some of the people watch this might not. So if you go to the Guardian newspaper, um, there's an article there about, about a, research, a journalist that's recently done the piece about the, about the work I'm doing. And she's shown, for example, how all, nearly every one of the specialist residential special schools, often paid for by local authority, that's school districts, 
these are almost all based in London and, and Surrey, which is the wealthiest part of the country. How in an area like Cambridge, where she managed to get in, into the look at the details, none of the none of the children getting getting special help for dyslexia were from the disadvantaged parts of the community. And all those youngsters, or this great proportion of them, were from the two wealthiest parts of a very large county area. And that and, sort of and, leads me into the next piece. What do we tell principals and policymakers based off of your findings? Well, I, I think what we, what we say to policymakers is don't believe what you're told from the dyslexia lobby. Because I, you know, when I was in Wisconsin, I was meeting senators and uh, you know, various, even the governor's office and you know, the same in, in uh, New York State. Um, I'm meeting people up there. I met principals and superintendents in, in Wisconsin. It was really interesting. But what's happened is that, in a sense, that there's such a strong lobby about, you know, that there is this thing, dyslexia, and you need experts to diagnose it, and then you need experts to intervene with it, and they've got these special programs, which disempowers the schools, disempowers the, the, the principals, disempowers the teachers. Um, and the politicians buy all this. They believe all this. And so what we need to do is to help the politicians understand that that's not the case. And that's really why I wrote this paper, because I really wanted this paper to be made accessible. The book I wrote in 2014 was more of a scientific study, which was read by academics. But this paper in our RRQ was written not only for ac academics and professionals, but also could be read by policymakers and, and, and parents as well. And that's like the perfect segue. So what do we tell parents? Uh, based off of your findings? Well, the, one of the things about, if, you, if you're a parent and you've got a child who's struggling and you know, crying at night and doesn't want to go to school and hates it and so on, you can understand that that parent will do everything they possibly can do to get every bit of resource and every bit of help they can. And so, of course, for that parent, they will be more than happy to get a diagnosis of dyslexia and if, uh, certainly in UK often additional resource sometimes even $30,000 a year spent on your child to go to an independent school for dyslexic kids paid for by the state so you can understand that I, all I can say to parents is I understand that but the problem is in our society is that there are finite resources and there are also many many other children who have much greater problems actually or problems as great as your kids and some much greater who aren't getting this and so we really as a society have to weigh up our needs for our own child against our sense of, uh, of social equity and what's fair for community and that's a very very difficult call for parents i understand that and i but the other thing that i think of as a parent like having learned um and read your piece is that i also think i can be an advocate for my kid even if they're not getting this like diagnosis of dyslexia, if I'm noticing them struggling, if I'm noticing them crying at night, whether they are defined as dyslexia, dyslexic or not, it seems like I can be an advocate to get my child support because it's not about the label as much as it is about the importance of the support. Yeah, and of course that varies a lot from one, of, from one school district to another, whether there's good systems in place and in some, in some schools, in some areas, I mean, some of the people I spoke to when I was in the state said that they kind of understood my argument or accepted my argument, but, but there was no way to get their child any help if they didn't go through this process, which they accept might not be very scientific, but actually was the only route that they could see. In some states in America, this was the case. The other thing I'd say for parents is this, that there are some times when children, um, children's intellectual abilities are underestimated by, by teachers and schools because the, the teachers are looking at their literacy, literacy skills and, and then somehow don't realize that, that these literacy skills are almost getting in the way of enabling that young person to engage in academic tasks, educational tasks, which challenge them intellectually. So one of the things I, I always say to parents is, don't allow your child's intellectual ability to be confused with their literacy, literacy skills. These are two separate things altogether. And I say the same thing to teachers. Don't make a judgment about a child's intellectual ability on the basis of their literacy skills. If they got very poor literacy skills, it may well be that you have to find ways to teach these children which absolutely challenge them intellectually 
um, much more than you might at first realise, because intellectually they could be very, very able actually and still struggling, or they may be actually not that able and struggling. You just really need to keep two things separate. Well, and that kind of brings me to where do we move next as a field for researchers? How does your paper move us forward? Well, I think firstly, is, is in, what researchers need to do is be very, very circumspect about what they mean when they use the term dyslexia. And they need to, to be in a sense that I don't think a lot of researchers are aware of how this plays out in policy or in practice. And so when I was speaking with neuroscientists and geneticists and sort of uh, cognitive scientists and so on, they wouldn't really know that, that this issue about how they used dyslexia would actually lead to this massive social inequity. That was another reason I wrote this paper, so that the people in those fields will understand when they use these terms, how this can get manipulated. For example, you, you, um, you do a study of the neuroscience of, of dyslexia. You, as your participants, you look at youngsters who've got very low reading scores. You then publish a paper on the neuroscience of dyslexia. And then the dyslexia industry says, oh, dyslexics are different from poor readers because we've got this scientific, this scientific paper which shows us about their brains. Well, you haven't. You've got a scientific paper which shows about the brains of youngsters who've been identified as poor readers. And I think what we need then is for the researchers to have a greater understanding of how this can play out, both in policy and in practice, and to write that accordingly. I think that's so important. And that kind of leads me to my next question. You mentioned it earlier, but the science of reading can be interpreted in a really kind of like divisive, um, this side or that side way. What do you, how does your work, or how do you think we come together to unite rather than divide? Yeah. The trouble is the word science has been used as a kind of a weapon now, I think. And I think that's the problem. And what do we mean by science? You know, years ago there was, there was a, you know, the reading wars were characterized by a difference between those who use what you might call the kind of quantitative hard end of reading. Um, and that was up against people who use kind of what you might describe as qualitative approaches and uh, um, yeah, teacher action research and so on. And these two camps were there um, battling with each other. And this was associated also with you know, the phonics in one camp and whole language in the other. Now we've got the science of reading, and in a sense what this is partly doing is sending subliminal messages about the importance of neuroscience and genetics and perhaps cognitive science. And one of the things that I suppose I found as a professor of educational psychology is that sometimes neuroscientists like to suggest that there is more found from their discipline to inform everyday educational practice than it really does. Um, and when you really scratch beneath the surface, and, and, and I've scratched hard, what you often find is people who do this work can confirm things that we're already doing. So in a sense, we, we kind of been doing something for 30, 40 years, or we see this as works well, you do this and it works well. And then someone does some neuroscience studies. At the moment, and if you, really, you know, if you look closely at the serious neuroscientists, they make the point quite clearly, they're not really at a stage when they can inform practice. Um, to any significant extent. It's certainly not in terms of doing something different. So, so I, I, I'm a bit nervous about the science of reading because I kind of think this term is being used in the reading wars just to, to get sort of more leverage over another group. I, I think that, you know, that, that, that it's, it's going to end up like dyslexia, that the word science is going to have multiple meanings and different people are going to hijack it in different ways. And I'm hoping that the various papers in your, in your special edition will be able to help reduce that tendency. Well, I think I hear two things from you. It, it seems like uh, we need to really be critical about our interpretation of the science of reading. And we also need to be broad. We need to think beyond just science in that term, but being more inclusive of what we consider science um, and yep. its implications and how closely yep. implications are to reading instruction. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely think so. Yes. And so, you know, this has been fascinating. I've learned so much and I'm excited to use it as I'm moving forward. What are some takeaway messages that um, we should emerge from this interview with based off of your piece? Okay, I think the key, key takeaway message is that as a society, we should not be in a position where any child goes into school, struggles to learn to read. And firstly, we don't notice. 
Um, secondly, that if we do notice, we don't know what to do. And thirdly, if we do notice, and we do know what we do at our level, but it's still not being sufficient, we don't have a system to help that youngster to make forward. In other words, we don't have a, you know, a backup um, support of one kind or another, which might be tier two or tier three or whatever in a kind of RTI model. And as a society that we should be doing that for all children, and we shouldn't be identifying a subgroup of those children who get a disproportionate amount of resource. And none of that is necessary. If we put in place the, the kinds of ideas where everyone knows what they're doing, we have a very clear system of progression. We do the very best we can, given our knowledge of you know, emerging knowledge of the best ways of helping people. We recognize that some of these people are not going to make progress given the approaches we've got now, but we don't know what else to do either. So there may well come a point when, when we have to absolutely um, um, think about what ways we can help people as they move through adolescence to develop skills using assistive technology and, and, and ways of, I've got a colleague in the School of Education here at Durham who has been blind since birth, who, um, who, uh, who is capable of scanning the internet using technology. She can, she can scan the internet as fast as I can using various technologies. Um, and she, obviously she can't read anything there. So, well, so, 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 that's, there, you know, so there, it seems like you're saying, we've got to get a better system, one that's more equitable, one that doesn't put a label that labels only a percentage or a portion of the students who are struggling. But we also need to know who's struggling. So we need to assess, we need to intervene, and we need to know when our interventions aren't working so that we can keep coming up with additional supports absolutely that's that's all absolutely the case all right well awesome well i'm so excited to take that knowledge forward um you know i really appreciate your work and if you have um any questions or if you want to read more you can read um julian elliott's article it's time to be scientific about dyslexia and you can find that in our rq special issue on the science of reading thanks yeah. so much dr elliott yeah, and thanks. Can I just say, how, you know, it's greatly honoured to be in RRQ. It was great, and I'm really so pleased to be not only in there, but also to be in there with so many other great researchers. I get a bit of vicarious glory rubbing off on me from some of these people, so that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I just really appreciate your criticality. I think this point is so important, this point about equity, this point about really thinking about struggling readers and why they're struggling rather than a label, um, and using that to intervene. Um, and I'm so glad you made it. So thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Bye.